You are now listening to the Pop Up Podcast. It's quite literally a podcast for whatever pops up. Here's the host of the show, director, producer, writer, and however else you know him, Pete Ferrero. So, how are you? I'm good. So I'm here with Joseph D'Onofrio, and uh, I'm I'm excited to dig into talking to you about A Bronx Tale, man. Well, I mean, it's a classic, yes? Yes. <laughs> it's my I think it's my favorite movie. I, I, I always say I always say like I love Goodfellas for what it you know for what it is, but there's something like really, I don't know, romantic about a Bronx tale and like special. You know what I mean? Even though there's violence and everything else <laughs> in it. Uh, sure. Yeah. So what was it like for you, man? How how did you get into acting anyway? When I was a kid. I used to break dance and okay. I did a lot of break dancing and I happened to be in a break dance contest called the Roxy big break dance contest in the city. And we ended up coming out at fifth out of like 500 people. So I toured break dancing with groups and stuff like that. And uh, my mom had told me I should get a manager for break dancing. So we did. And then I don't know, the manager sent me out on a couple of commercial auditions for break dancing. And I had got the I had got the auditions. I booked them, so I did a lot of commercials. I never really wanted to be an actor, but I just fell into it. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. and then I just kept auditioning, and then that that's how I became an actor. That's that's really awesome. So I know this isn't on the list, but what whatever happened with the break dancing? That's really I didn't know that. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm still breaking. I'm still breaking here. <laughs> okay, again. good. Yeah. There's some pop back spins. You know, some windmills if you need. <laughs> so um, you did Goodfellas in 1990. Did you make connections from Goodfellas for getting into A Bronx Tale? Yes, I made connections basically because when I worked with Robert De Niro, he had seen me and he had been involved in buying the Bronx Tale script from Chaz. So when he bought it, they called my agent and basically said they wanted me to do the reading with them. And I did the reading, the first reading of A Bronx Tale, I think before Robert De Niro even bought it and made the deal with Chaz. But I think I made, I, I didn't make a connection basically like on that set where he said, oh, I want you to be in a movie. But basically we made the connection by he met me and he thought I would have been right for the movie. I got you. And so did you have to audition for A Bronx Tale? No. No audition? I, I was like one of the only ones that didn't audition. I think uh, me, Chaz, and De Niro, and Joe Pesci, I think were the only ones that didn't audition. Everybody else did. Oh, that's really awesome. So uh, what, did yeah. you, what did you initially think of the script when you got it? I thought it was amazing. I thought it was great. Chaz is an awesome writer. Loved loved everything in it, and um, just wasn't. I was uh, what's it called? I was like very. Uh, what was it? I was very grateful, and I was just like amazed at how many lines were in it, and thinking, "Wow, it's a lot of work." <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, now, so how do you? What do you do when you get a script like that? Do you immediately go into like memorizing the lines and shit, or where where does where does your mind go first? Well, it depends. If I get the job. If I book the job, mm -hmm. then I'll read the script. Then I'll read my scenes. And then basically I'll break down my scenes of what emotions I'm going to have in the scene and how I want to say the scene and what I think about the scene. And then basically memorizing comes last. Mm -hmm. After I do all the work and I write everything down on the paper of the emotions and what's going on and stuff like that. And how I'm interacting with the other the other characters and stuff like that. That's interesting. So who who calls you and says, "Okay, you got this. You're you're in." Well, it depends. I mean, sometimes my manager, sometimes my agent, sometimes people that are like like you might call me and say, "I need you for a web series." So I, <laughs> right, right. I don't call anybody, you know. You just, the people just call me personally sometimes. Like John Gallagher calls me up. Oh, I need you. I'm doing a movie. Willie DeMeo calls me up. Oh, I'm doing a TV show. I need you. You know, and that's how sometimes it happens. 
So in a Bronx tale, who was the one that told you? Was it your agent that said, okay, you got this? Or did you kind of know I got this because you were one of the ones that didn't have to audition? Well, what happened was I had the part. I mean, for a long time, but the union went on strike, I believe. So they shut down production for like a half a year, maybe even a year. So I didn't think it was going to happen. And then the union went back on and we did it. But uh, yeah, the agent called me and told me. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, you must have been super excited. Yeah, I I guess I was excited. I mean, I really wasn't into acting and stuff like that. So I really didn't, I didn't watch a lot of movies as a kid. Right. I really didn't know the magnitude of the movie and that I was getting involved with. Like, I didn't realize like how big of a star Robert De Niro was. Right. People I was working with and like being on a $30 million set. You know, it was just like basically just like going to work and like like it was nothing to be, to be honest with you. I think that's why they liked me, Bob. Right. Uh, so what was it like when you get on set for the first time? For the first time when I get on set, I mean. Uh, well, out of a Bronx tale, obviously. Of yeah. a Bronx tale. I mean, basically, I mean, it was so long ago. But basically, you get on the set, you just go in your trailer, you get in your clothes, you go to makeup and you go to the set and you do your work. I mean, are you looking at all these areas like, okay, that's the bar? Like, because, you know, it's one thing to read it on a script, right? And then you see all these places sort of come to light, the uh, the life, the stoop, the, you know, there's the bar, there's the thing. What is, what is your feeling at that point? Like, oh my God, this is, this is the, fu- this is the fucking movie, you know? I'm like, wow. The, well, the, the set designer was um, Wynn Thomas, which is an excellent, 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 great guy. And he did such a great job. When I seen the club, I was like, wow, it's a great club. Really nice. And the inside was nice, too. I don't know if they showed the inside. Yeah. On the inside, they had like a jukebox and a pool table and stuff. I don't think they showed the inside in the movie, but we we were on the inside, at like in between takes and stuff like that. It was so- great. I was amazed that the, the work they did on all the stuff, the bar, the school bus. The, right. The big thing was the... When we blew up the the corner store, when we shot up the store, we put it on fire. Yeah. Amazing how they made that. They actually made that. We like put it on fire and then they had to like put it back together and then we put it on <laughs> fire again. So crazy. Oh, that's crazy. What yeah. scenes what scenes did you shoot first? Do you remember? The scenes that we shot first. I think the scenes were in the in the school mm-hmm. when we were walking through the hallway. Right. And uh C is telling me about, you know, about Louis Dumps. I'm like, ah, it's twenty dollars. What are you gonna do or whatever? I'm still gonna break his jaw or something like that. Yeah, that was such a great I, line. <laughs> first location. Thank you. Um, what were your reactions of the other kids? Speaking of the kids, did you all guys? Did you guys hang out together? Did you guys get along? Yeah, we got along. We we met. What happened was before the audition process was a little different on this one than most movies because I would get a call from my agent. And they say, oh. uh, they want to see you up at Tribeca. And I'd be like, okay. And then I'd go up there and I'd have a bunch of kids up there. Like, I guess people that they wanted for different parts. Mm-hmm. And we do all, and we do like a big improv scene. Must've happened like three or four times. And every time I was like, the first time there was like six kids, the second, and there were six kids. And the second time I went, there were six kids, but there was like two of the same ones and four different ones. <laughs> And then I go back and I kept getting like three of the same, four of the same, five of the same, and then boom. And then they just, that's what happened. And yeah, when we were on set, we were kind of, you know, we, uh, we got along. Basically I knew that a lot of them weren't actors. They were from the street. They were just regular kids that wanted to be actors that, you know, just auditioned like, cause they went all over. They went to clubs, they went to all, you know, the neighborhoods, the churches, everywhere they go to find these characters. So basically I wanted to make them feel comfortable. So basically, yeah, we hung out, we talked, you know, but just on the set, I mean, after after we stopped shooting, I mean, we all went home and, you know, came back to the set the next day. We didn't, like, hang out afterwards. Right. Now, did where was your hangout on set? Was it just in your own trailer or is it, like, a catering? Or where, where are you guys all, all hanging out and connecting? I mean, everybody had their own little trailer, but, I mean, the Hells Angels who played the, the bikers... They, they were staying in a house. So sometimes, like, if we were shooting, like, when we were shooting the scene in front of the club, the biker's house was right across the street. So sometimes we would just go over to the house and hang out in the house in between scenes and come back because the trailers were, like, a couple of blocks away because right. they had to keep it 
place or we'd be at craft service or we'd be at lunch. You know, we always sat together for lunch and had lunch and this. And I was, I think I was, you know, a little older than everybody else. I was maybe like three, four years older than everybody else. So, you know, everybody was kids. They were like 16, 17 years old. Yeah, that must have been fun. So in the in the movie, uh, you said that uh, they didn't use the inside of the bar. Uh, but there is that scene where they have the biker fight. Is that a different, is that just a set or is that the bar? No, that I'm talking about our club, the inside of our club. Oh, okay, your club. I'm, I got what you're saying. I got what you're saying. Okay, yeah, yeah. Deuce is wild. They didn't show. I don't think. I mean, but I have pictures in there. I don't really think they showed the inside. No, I don't think they did. No, it was just the exterior of your of your yeah. guys' club. Yeah, uh, that that was pretty cool though. So, so the the what was the set like? Put us in the world there of a Bronx Tale set. The bar is the bar where the fight happens with the bikers. That's a real bar. And did you guys spend some time in there? I mean, I didn't spend any time in there, to be honest with you. I mean, I know it was the bar. I was there the day they did that scene because we had the one scene where we beat up the guy. Right. But I could I ran away. But I didn't actually see them doing the scene. I actually just got to the set, did my scene, and I got out of there. But I remember the scene when uh, Chaz hit all the bikes and stuff. It was great. It was a big crowd out there. It was a lot of people. You know, everybody was dressed up. I mean, I loved the clothes that they had. Totally. And it was just awesome. I mean, Chaz was just amazing with, with that character. And, and De Niro playing the father, I mean, it was just a, an amazing experience. Yeah. I mean, so are you, are you, uh, so are you able to watch some of this play out or are you basically just chilling in your trailer? Oh, no. I could watch it play out if I want. Basically, yeah. what I do sometimes, I really don't like when I, if I'm not doing the scene, I'd rather just stay in my trailer and wait because I don't want to get in the way. Right. And of I course. don't want to. And, and bother anybody so basically unless i need to be there to know for further reference then i'll be there but if i don't have to be there i'd rather just stay in the trailer because you know, if everybody if all the actors came out of the trailers and watched the scene i mean you won't have time you know the director will be like uh, you know what are you doing uh, who's gonna look at the screen and have all the actors up? you know, I know what i mean i know exactly what you mean like okay we're, we're shooting here uh did, did you when you were on set and you're making the movie now you know it went from script and you're seeing the scenes play out, the scenes you're in, did you say to yourself, "This, I am on another classic film, or did you did you not know and say, we'll see how this plays out? Uh, I really didn't know what was going on, to be honest with you. Because like I said, I wasn't really into acting in movies, so I really just took it as like a job. It was like I was going to work, and I just went to work and did my thing. I really didn't even like think twice about, like, wow, you know, oh my God, this is going to be a classic, right. you know? Goodfellas when I did Goodfellas 2 and all the other movies I've been in a couple of classics but back when I was a kid I really didn't know too much but now when I look back on it I'm like wow so amazing that I had the opportunity to be in such classics and you know and now you know I just finished a film with Val Kilmer that I think is going to be another classic called The Birthday Cake with a bunch of good characters and uh you know hopefully it, yeah. you know it's going to be great. That's awesome. And and I wanted to ask you I'll I'll pop this in first but first of all um you're doing a comedy show, right, up in uh, in New York, coming up, I think, this week, right? Staten Island, January 18th. Yeah, that sounds like it's going to be a good one. I mean, what what are you, what is the is comedy? Gonna be, is this going to be on before then or no? Yeah, it will be. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. What, um, what, what, what kind of, how did you develop your comedy act? And I'll jump back into a Bronx tale in a second here, but how did you develop your comedy act and what kind of things are you talking about? Do you talk about any of this stuff? Like, uh, your experience being a kid. Well, first of all, January 18th is Staten Island. February 15th is Bali is in Atlantic City. And then we're going to be in the city at Stand Up New York in April. But my stand up comedy is basically sometimes I tell stories and I tell a lot of jokes. That's awesome. One line is a lot of talking with the audience. Basically, a lot of funny faces, a lot of funny voices. You know, I do characters. That's cool, man. So uh, the January eighteenth is where now? It's at. It's in New York at the. Staten Broadway? Island. The code is Diner. It's in a diner in Staten Island. I mean, I got a lot of fans in Staten Island, so I figured, why not do a show out there? So we're doing a show, and uh, it's almost sold out. So, you know, that's thank awesome. God, people like me. 
Yeah, well, you're like you're you're a likable guy, man. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll share all of that stuff on social media and all that, so that the people can come out and uh, maybe hear some of this in person. So uh, back to the Bronx. So what was it like when you were getting direction from Robert De Niro? Do you you said you didn't really watch movies, so you don't do you see him as Robert? De, oh f- shit, this is Robert De Niro, or are you just like this guy is telling me what to do? <laughs> No, I just look at him as like he's my boss. It's Bob, you know. It's like it's like you know, I didn't look at him basically like you know Robert De Niro, you know. I mean, if I knew now what I knew then, <laughs> right? Yeah, I probably would have been a little nervous or whatever because the guy's amazing. He's an icon. Sure. But I mean, basically, I went to work and I just did whatever he told me. And to be honest with you, I mean, he directed some. I mean, basically, I came to the set prepared and ready to roll. So, I mean, most of my stuff was on point. He did direct a couple, he directed everything, but I mean, he gave me a couple of pointers and it was just, it, when I think back on it, it's like going to acting school. Cause I totally. remember when I did, this, when I hit the guy off the bike and I said to him, I said, I think I should be saying something right here, like something. And he just looks at me. He's like, don't say nothing. Just make a face and walk. He goes, you don't need to say anything because basically you're doing it, so you don't have to say anything. And ever since then, I was, I use that because when yeah. I'm doing stuff and people tell me, like, I remember there was a movie. I hit some guy with a bottle, and um, they told me to say something. I was like, I don't think I should say something. They see it already. And we did it like that, and it was so much better. And basically, yeah. And then a couple of other times he directed me when we did the gun scene. Well, or he would, like, we would, do, we would do a lot of a rehearsal, and basically he let us do whatever we wanted, like uh, improv-wise. And then after it, he'd be like, all right, keep that, keep that, keep that. All right, move there, move there. And then, uh, you know, and that was basically a lot of improv. It was great. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. And like you said, it was almost like acting school in a way, right? Yeah, and basically he let us, basically we had free range and basically do whatever we really wanted. I mean, as long as it stood to the character and stood to, you know, the scene. And, you know, sometimes when you get into character, you just, you know, you just start becoming the character and things just come out that you don't even realize come out and you, you just got to roll with it. And it's great when a director gives you the freedom to do that. I have a question that is not on the list of questions, but um, when you get into character for a movie like this or any of the movies that you've done, is it hard for you to get out of character? You know, like maybe <laughs> like that week, are you still almost this kid and it's tough to be both people because you're, you're almost two people at one point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, in the be- beginning, like, I really didn't know too much about, you know, the business and stuff. So it took a little longer, Mm -hmm. but now that, you know, I've been doing it a while. I realize how to just get out of it and realize it's just acting. And I got to get back to being Joe. Right. Joseph. And actually I just uh, did something where uh, I played like a crazy guy and this other, he wrote actually a comedy, the guy. And I told him I like doing comedy so much better because when you do comedy, you're laughing. And when you finish with the part, you're laughing. But if you're playing somebody that's a, a knucklehead and a killer, you know, when you finish doing the scene, you know, you're still, you're still a knucklehead and a punk. Right. You know, you got to get out. You know, if you go out, if, if you're doing a scene like where you're really nasty and then, you know, you're going out to dinner like a half an hour later, you know, you got to realize, listen, you're not that character no more. If the waiter right. is late giving you water, don't curse him out. <laughs> um, what was it like in the movie you had, uh, like a younger you, a kid playing – a different version of you in a different time period. Uh, did you get, first of all, did you guys get along and what was that experience like? Yeah. I mean, we, we, got, I actually ended up getting that guy the part because basically he's my friend, Patrick. He lived in my neighborhood and I was like walking one day to the park and he's like, Hey Joe, I'm, I want to be an actor. Can you help me out? And it just so happened the Bronx they were looking for people. And I told him, I told his mother to call them up and he went up on audition and he ended up playing me as a kid. And yeah, we got along great. Ever since we still get along. We actually just did a TV show a couple of months ago, and um, he's still acting, and he's actually bigger than me now. So it's funny. Oh, that's that's funny. Uh, well, it's interesting too about that because I always feel like the the kid that played you. Obviously, you guys are younger, so um, you know he, he wasn't as maybe as verbal as you. But like the character really, really comes to life. Obviously, once you take it, take sort of take it over. And that's no offense to to the other actor. It's just you know how it's written, probably. But how much? And we we kind of touched upon this. How much are you allowed to improv? And how much is the written word? 
uh, in the various scenes that you're in, because some of it is some of the stuff that you say is absolutely classic. So I'm wondering how much of that is you or how much of that is is the, the word? Well, you know, a lot of it is me and a lot of it's 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 both, you know, it's both. Some was written and some wasn't. I mean, I have the script inside. I could get it for you if you want and let you know what was scripted and what wasn't. Yeah. Let's... <laughs> let me see. Oh, yeah let all right. Me... Yeah. <laughs> I love this. Hold on. Let me get it. I got it. Yeah, that's funny. This is the only. This is the only script I got, and I didn't even realize I could look through it and see your notes. Yeah. So yeah, did you good. did you uh, do you keep ar any artifacts from the set and all that stuff, or not usually? No, not usually. I got something that from Jungle Fever. They gave me a shirt. Nice. A Bronx Tale. I got this. That's. I mean, only because I didn't have it. Let's see. Open the door. There's different names in here. I'm trying to think of a page. Stomp the biker. It says. Slick Mario and Aldo and Ralph with kids stomping biker. It says over there. There's no lines, but it just says. So there was no lines over there. Gene, trying to look, see. What about, what about the line when you say uh, you guys are all looking at the guns and you say, uh, I really want to shoot somebody? Is that an improv line or is look, that. This is how it's supposed to go. Hey, Zero, what do you got for me this week? I hope something's good. Nikki Zero. Now, this is a 45, and you know, that was all. That was all scripted. Then Zero's like, this is more you, Slick. This is class. Do you like it? See, that's a nice piece. Zero, you want one too? Don't move. I got one for you. Try this on, see? Feel it. Touch it. And then and then Sonny. Hey, see? That was the scene. <laughs> that's crazy. Everything else was improv. Yeah, it's Everything, good. I want to shoot somebody. Hey, give me that gun. What are you pointing at? Well, I, right. I, well, I didn't realize how small that scene was. Yeah. There was three lines in that. I didn't even have a line in that scene. I had That's one line, one with zero. Hey, zero, what do you got for me this week? I hope something good. That was the only line. Everything else was improv. But basically, Marty Scorsese does that a lot. Like, he'll write a scene with basically minimal lines. And then when you get there, you just, you go with it. Yeah. And you make it up. So basically, wow, I, I, that's the first time I actually read that. I didn't even realize that. So, yes, that whole, that whole scene was basically improv, I guess, right? Because yeah. There's only one line in there. That's, abs <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. Well, I remember doing it, and he pointed the gun. I was like, oh, what are you pointing that gun at? You know? And yeah. Then, you know, and then I was like, oh, I like this gun. Yeah, I want to shoot somebody, you know? And yeah. it's like. And yeah, I, was just, I, mean, like, I was just so into the character, basically. It was, it was such a classic line in the movie. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's interesting that it's totally improv, you know? Um, then that, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of notes here. Yeah, I never really looked through this. Aldo and Slick. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of lines, like, made up because I could see, like, on the page. There's extra, like, I wrote extra lines in there. I think that's, like, I would go home and look at the scene. Yeah. And then we see... You know, it was funny because Tom Hanks, when he won the, he won the, he got the award at the Golden Globes. They yeah. nominated, what's it called? They gave him that, uh, thing. Lifetime Achievement or whatever. Yeah. Lifetime mm -hmm. achievement. He said, always come, come on time, know your texts and have choices. And basically that's how I am. I always like to, I don't even come on time. I like to come early. Come right. Like 15 minutes early. I like to know my lines and I, I always like to have choices, but I understand, you know, the director's the boss. If he, doesn't like when I bring him, I say, okay, no problem. And I just keep moving. Unless I really strongly feel, I might take him on the side and be like, listen, why don't we just do it my way once and do it your way another time? Right. And then, you know, and then that's it. And then if he says no, I just keep moving. You know what I mean? You guys exactly. Um, so, so how has your acting method changed from when you were a kid to now? I mean, I guess because then you weren't really in, you didn't even know much about acting. I'm sure you've developed a style or a personal way that you, you know, a method to your, to your acting madness, I guess. What, how, what is your acting method now? Basically when I was doing a Bronx tale and all those movies, I was basically emulating people that I know. And I was just like thinking of them, like kid people I knew from the neighborhood and stuff like that. I really didn't have a method, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But now I do have a method, and right, and now I do a lot of research, and I do a lot of 
you know, looking on the internet. I mean, I played a geek once. I looked up how to do how how geeks were. I watched videos. You know, if I'm doing like a TV show, like I I, I booked a show called Gotham. I played a character on that. I watched the show and I seen it was like a creepy kind of show. So I did my character type of type of, type of creepy. Right. Because you know, they were looking for a lobster type. And I seen the script. And the script was basically like, I'm sure everybody went in and it was like, Hey, Gordon, how you doing? What's going on? <laughs> right. Hey, yeah. I need this. Meanwhile, I came in, I was like, Gordon, <laughs> what do you need from me, Gordon? You right. need anything? <laughs> and basically, I got the part because I did my research. I mean, acting, I mean, you just don't go to a set and, you know, do the acting. Plus, there's so much more involved. I mean, there's, you know, staying in the camera, staying in the light, you know, not overlapping the other actors, staying out of the other actor's light, you know, yeah. working with the other actor, working with the director, you know, there's so much involved. But yeah, I like to get close as much to the character as I could. I like to do things different, different too. Like if I get a part, I try to do it different than I did it in another movie. Right. Sometimes it's hard because you're always playing crazy guys. So you're like, you know, I played so many crazy guys. It's like, how many different ways can you do it? Yeah. But you're certainly finding a way because, I mean, every character, like now that you mentioned, every character does have some sort of uniqueness to them that's not like, and you see that a lot with like the mobster actors. They're always sort of the same person in the various different movies. But I don't feel that way about you. I feel your character. Go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. say, I, I, no, I was gonna say, like you in uh, Goodfellas is very different from you in Bronx Tale versus you in, the, like you said, Gotham or whatever. Yeah, well, you know what it is. It's like sometimes when I get a part two, I always think to myself too, I don't want to do it the same way I did it in this movie. So I try to think of a way to do it differently, like like uh, like in the in the TV show Gravesend with Willie DeMeo. Uh, my character is a gangster. He's a made guy, but basically he's got a lot of class. He's cool and he's calm. Right. But if you mess with the familiar, but I didn't want him to be like off the handle, like slick or like my character from wannabes, you know, some characters I play like that, like the gangster's son. It's like you play a gangster's son. You're going to be, you're going to be uh, crazy. Right. You're going to be off pain. There's nothing I could do about that. I have to play that not almost the same way. Maybe I can say my words differently. Maybe my uh, hand movements a little differently, different things like that. Maybe my walk will be different. I mean, I try to just make them a little different just because I want to give, you know, the people out there them to say, Oh wow, it's not the same character. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, in Bronx tales. So you have a couple of great interactions with Chaz. He smacks you. I think he, I think he knocks you around a little bit. Uh, what was, what was, what was it like to work with Chaz and, you know, and do some of those scenes. Oh man, Chaz was great. I loved working with Chaz, such a professional and awesome guy. I mean, that night we did the, that night we did the, the scene, the car scene. It was crazy because it was raining out that night. It was like drizzling. So it was very cold. And, um, he was a very, he was a trooper, man. We got out, got to the set, banged out the scene and we did it. And I don't even remember, yeah, I want to actually look at the scene. The car pulls to a stop at the light. Suddenly there's a hangs on the window next to Slick. Sonny, hey, see, Sonny, hey, get out of the car. Oh, yeah, this, and then I'm like, honey, he's with us. Mind your fucking business, you. Hey, Sonny, I said, mind your business. Get in the car over there. All right, Sonny, take it easy. All right, good. So that basically, there was a little improv in that. There was. But it yeah. was great. He it was, was great. He wasn't. He wasn't supposed to hit my head on the thing, but I think he just did it. So it was really good. We were pumped up, too. I remember before the scene, like, a lot of actors, too, like De Niro, Chaz, a lot of times if they're doing a scene like that, before the scene, before they even say action, you're like, they'll, they'll start, like, arguing with you or something. Like, hey, what the hell are you doing? What, blah, blah, blah. So then when you do the scene, you're, you're, you're there. Right. Like when I did analyze that with De Niro and he hung me off the roof, like I remember before the scene, he said, come on, let's wrestle a little. And we were like wrestling and moving around ah, for like a minute. And then they said action, then boom, we were like in this scene. And that was like another, you know, you work with these big people, you know, you learn so much from them. Chaz, his technique was amazing. I mean, the guy was on point. That's interesting. I mean, at times I'm sure you're like, are we arguing about something? For real, or are we getting into character? You know what I mean. It must be confusing at times. You know, are we? Are we? You know, 
Well, they would say it like he'd be like, oh, let's do it. Let's before the scene, let's get into the scene by arguing and stuff like that. Totally. And I used that in my own stuff. I remember I did a movie with, um, what's his name? Paulie, Paulie, uh, the boxer, Paulie, uh, what's the boxer's name? Paulie, uh, Magic- I don't know how to say his last name. That's okay. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I uh, did a movie with him and I had told him, you know, before the scene, you got to, you know. Yeah. Make believe, you're, make believe you're there. Like, you know, if you're going to kill somebody, make believe why you're killing them and what's going on before they say action. You want to be in the scene like 30 seconds before they say action. That's so awesome. basically you're there already. So when they say action, boom, you're in Yeah, it. that's that's awesome. Um, and then yeah, there's the scene where Slick dies in the movie. And sorry, spoiler alert in case someone hasn't seen the movie yet, but uh, it would be crazy. He dies? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> oh, he died. Is he dies in the movie? Oh my god! Wow, I thought he lived. I thought he could just got burnt up. I thought he was he was alive. I think they bring him to the hospital after that. Right. Um, what was it like to film those scenes out? Is it all stuntmen? Are you? I'm sure you're in. Obviously, we see your face in some of it. So, what what was that like? Well, basically, I actually got put on fire. You see me on fire. My legs. I let them do a stunt where they put my feet on fire and I, they put me out. So that was me. But wow. in the car, I was a stuntman. Yeah. But I was there that they did it. They did it a couple of times. And we shot up the actual club on the corner. Like I said, we shot it up and then we'd, they'd have to redo it. So they did it like three, four times. I remember they, they had like six cameras that night. But it was crazy. When I shot the window, when I shoot the window, yeah. there was a sniper on the roof. And when I shot... He shot the window from the roof, so when you see the window, the the window explode, he uh-huh. really was getting shot, but from a sniper up up top, like over my shoulder. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, and they had the gun, like they had the gun wired or something up my leg, and there was a wire up my leg when I was moving. So when I shot it, I don't know that that's how they made it work. That's crazy. That's that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, if if Slick didn't die in the film. What do you think would have happened to him? He would have probably died in a couple of a couple of years later. <laughs> he probably, who knows, maybe that, or maybe he would end up in jail, or who knows, maybe he would have straightened out. Maybe if he lived, that might have, maybe he might have seen the light and been like, you know what, I got to yeah. straighten my life out. Maybe he, you know, would get a regular job. I would yeah. hope. I mean, sometimes people start off bad because basically the environment that you grow up in everybody's doing the same thing. So you think it's normal. Maybe Slick thought that, you know, what he was doing was normal. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you need somebody to like teach you that, you know, that's not normal behavior. Normal behavior is being nice and not beating people up and having a good time. Right. Well, and the kids, obviously the, the club was on the block, right? So Slick and all those kids saw that lifestyle right in front of them all the time. So the neighborhood sort of brought it out of them, maybe. I guess. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. Like, look at C. C grew up, you know, bringing the gangster stuff. So, you know, that's what he ended up doing. And, you know, that's what happens a lot in life with people. The environment you grow up in, that's yeah. basically what the, uh, most of the time, not all the time, but sometimes it helps you. Sometimes, you know, you see bad people when you do the opposite. Sometimes you see good people when you become bad. I mean, and your brain is a crazy machine. Totally. So recap, recap the entire experience, man. What do you, what do you think about a Bronx Tale now after all these years later? Wow, I think it's a classic. I think it's one of the best movies around. I mean, the story is great. The way it moves, the acting. I mean, just the characters are just like Eddie Mush, uh, Louis Dumps, you know, uh, Crazy Mario. I mean, you know, these characters' names, the 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 the, the door test. Uh, the right. Mario, I mean, you know, all all the things Chaz talks about to see, you know, a lot of lessons, you know, Mickey Mantle. I mean, De Niro's character, you know, the working man. I run into so many people that say that, you know, that was their life. Right. And I think it's a classic. I think people keep watching it and keep watching it, you know. I mean, I, every- I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I got a chance to be in it when I look back on it. And I think about, you know, how I got the part and how I didn't audition and how, you know, it was like locked in that I was slick, like from the beginning, I think to myself, wow, it's just amazing that I didn't even have to audition for the part. And I heard a lot of people actually wanted. 
I'm still good. Hold on a second. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you there? Yeah. Oh, cool. I'm sorry. That's okay. Actually, uh, you heard a lot of people uh, want it. A lot of people wanted that part, I heard. But uh, De Niro wanted me, I heard. So they didn't even see anybody because they were just locked in on having me. I guess they really thought I was great for the character. That's awesome. Um, how? When was the last time you saw it? If it, if you see it on AMC or one of these stations, do you find yourself sitting down and watching it, or do you skip the channel <laughs> because you've seen it so many times? I usually skip the channel. I usually skip it. I don't really like watching myself. I mean, I think a couple of years ago I watched it and I was like, I always critique myself, you know, like because a lot of words I said, I hit a lot of words like I want to shoot somebody or. That, you know, my, my language was a little different. Right. But when I, when I look at it, people love that language. Yeah. And I say to myself, why well, in certain words that if I was, you know, looking at a script now, I would pump up those words. And when I think, like, I really wasn't doing a big technique thing back then. Right. I thought it was pretty good work. It's phenomenal, man. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, for it to be, there's got to be something about your, you know, because that was such a young age that you were doing some of that stuff. There has to be like a natural gift or talent that you have. And I'm not just kissing your ass, but at, to be able to do that at that age and to be able to perform that way, I think obviously you have something that's in you that is meant to do what you do. I think basically, I mean, like people usually tell me I was just a natural because I basically was just, I just did it. Yeah. And now that I look at the scene with the gun scene and I'm like, wow, I knew it was improv, but I didn't know it was that much improv. I'm like, <laughs> wow. I did a lot of improv in that scene. And, uh, you know, I'm just like, you know, I guess I, I, yeah, a lot of people tell me that too, that, you know, I'm a natural when I do things. It's just like, you know, it comes easy for me. And I'm sure the comedy is the same in a way. Um, and that's, again, the 18th in Staten Island, right? And then February, what was the other one? In Atlantic City, February twenty fifth, fifteenth, fifteenth. But you can always just check my website, like uh, Joseph D'Onofrio on Facebook, uh, Joseph D'Onofrio official on Instagram, and I always got a poster or something up there. I'm promoting it or something like that. There's always a link on Eventbrite, Joseph D'Onofrio. I mean, you know, it's a funny show. I usually get the best comics in the city when I'm in the city. Now I got some good guys on Staten Island coming out. Should be funny. It's a great night. We hang out. I mean, they have a meet and greet afterwards. And then probably afterwards, we're probably all going to go out maybe to a disco and hang out and dance with everybody. We're gonna, I'm going to invite everybody over if they want to come. Oh, that's very cool. Um, last question. Was it difficult uh, being a child star? Are there pitfalls that come with that? And how did you overcome some of that, if so? Yes, there's a lot of pitfalls because basically, I mean, I mean, a lot of people really like you for the wrong reasons and a lot of people... Uh, want to be your friend because they think you're famous or that, you know, you could get certain treatment or, you know, and sometimes you, you don't, you got to know how to basically, basically you got to know how to know who's real and who isn't real. Mm -hmm. And you got to know about life, you know, and know that, you know, you're just a regular person, man. You're not better than nobody else just because you've been in a couple of movies and just because people like you and just because, like, when you go to a restaurant, people want to, like, buy you dessert or even pick up your dinner or come over and take a picture with you. You know, you got to just basically realize that, you know, people like you. And, you know, you got to enjoy it and be grateful about it. Don't think you're all that because, you know, people like, you know, like you. And to be honest with you, when I first started acting, I mean, you know, and I did a lot of movies, I was in a lot of big movies and like a lot of people filled my head up and, you know, made me think I was all that. Yeah. And I had like a little attitude in the beginning because basically I grew up, my father passed away when I was younger. My mom lived down in Florida. So basically I was in New York by myself. I don't have a big brother. I don't have nobody really guiding me and telling me about, you know, how to deal with fame. Right. And, you know, and if you don't deal with it, you know, you could end up going on a bad path and you see it. And actors that, you know, how many people die, how many people, you know, even looking at watching TV, watching the Golden Globes and seeing actors get up and accept awards and you can just see how weird they are. Right. I mean, it's hard sometimes because, you know, you're like this, I mean, not me, but, you know, just being a big famous actor, it's like you can't really go out on the street. You know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard. It's very hard. And yeah. if you don't know how to deal with it, 
You know, you could ruin your whole life or just be a miserable life. Like, look at the movie Judy. I just seen that movie, Judy Garland. She's like one of the biggest stars. Meanwhile, she was miserable. Yeah. You know, she was like one of the miserable persons around. I mean, but what I do is basically, I'm grateful, man. When people come up to me and say, hey, we loved you in this, we loved you in that. I'm like, thank you so much. And it's never annoying. It's never a problem. It's always just being grateful and enjoying it and enjoying knowing that people like my work and people want to know me and people want to take a picture with me. And I should be grateful for that. I mean, some actors, they're like, oh, man, why are you bothering me for? Like, oh, oh, can I have an autograph? No, I'm busy. Leave me alone. It's like, you know, you want an autograph? Sure, no problem. Right. Thank you for liking my You know, these are the people that are going to, you know, come see your movies and you make friends. It's like I did the chiller up in Jersey where basically you sign autographs and people come to your station and you sign autographs, you sign posters and fans come and, you know, collectors. And it was great because I made so many new friends. Totally. And it's great. You know, Sometimes it could get crazy, like if you're out, you know, and you're like, you know, like you're on a plane or you're at like a funeral or you're at like a show and like you just want to like go to the funeral and pay your specs and people are coming up to you. Hey, what's up, Joe? How you doing? I like your work. You know what I mean? Yes. It, it, sometimes it could get crazy, but, you know, you got to be always be grateful. Well, and speaking of grateful, man, I'm really grateful and thankful that you uh, took some time with us this morning to talk all about uh, this experience, Bronx Tale, man. I think the world of you, I think you're a phenomenal actor. But I think you're even a better person. So uh, it's it's just so awesome to have you here and to share some of that with you. Again, so you're going to just run again, run where you're going to be. And uh, so everybody knows how to get you and uh, find the comedy shows and everything else that you're going to be in. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. I'm grateful that you're able to be on. You're a great guy. I love doing your pilot. Maybe one day it'll get picked up. Let's hope. If not, we got <laughs> web series we're doing that's right it was a great pilot but i think you should show a clip of the pilot on this on your on this podcast or something i will but for I, sure. i'm on facebook i'm on facebook as joseph d'onofrio i'm on instagram as official joseph d'onofrio and if you want to see one of my comedy shows just go on facebook go on instagram and check me out like me uh follow me Come to my shows January 18th. We're in Staten Island. We got a seven o'clock show and a 930 show. And then I'm in Atlantic City, Bally's. And then basically I'm going to be in the city in April. And I just finished a couple of pilots, Silent Partners, Gravesend, Street Smart, Bensonhurst. And I just have finished a couple of movies, The Birthday Cake, Sarah Q, Made in Chinatown, got Ghost in the Graveyard, a horror movie out on, uh, on Amazon Prime right now. Going to start a new movie soon with John Gallagher called All Mobbed Up. And we're going to continue shooting Gravesend with Willie DeMeo. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome, man. And that's about it. It's awesome. You don't, stop, you don't stop working. So I think that's really, really awesome. Uh, all right, man. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Have a good night. You too, bud. I'll talk all to right. you soon. Let me know when you finish. Okay. Will do. Ciao. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye. Today's episode of the Pop-Up Podcast was brought to you by Sunspot Films. Thanks for listening. For updates, check out poppuppodcast.com.